Well, good morning, and, and welcome. Uh, a warm welcome to those of you watching online as well. We know you're you're with us, and uh, we're glad that you've joined us. Before we look in God's Word, would you pray with me? Let's let's bow. I'm grateful for uh, the opportunity to gather in your name. Uh, Lord Jesus, thank you for what you've done for us. For your perfect life. For your death and resurrection. Lord, for your ascension. For your giving us the gift of your, your Holy Spirit. Lord, as we study uh, your blueprints of how we are to live in your family, in the church... Lord, give us understanding. Lord, move us by your Spirit to, to follow and obey you. We commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. By God's grace, I was raised in a Christian home. My mom and dad loved the Lord. They loved each other. They loved me. I can't remember not being a part of not just a, a Christian home, a Christian family, but of also belonging to a church family. It's just, it just the life that I knew. By God's grace, I have warm memories, happy memories of, of life in both families. In my church life, I was blessed to have good pastors, good elders, godly deacons, men and women who who served tirelessly our, our church family, good relationships with brothers and sisters in Christ. I, I was blessed to belong to a healthy church, not a perfect church. You won't find one. If you do, don't join it. You'll wreck it. You'll wreck it. But, but it was a healthy church. It was, it was a good church. And uh, if you've experienced fairly healthy family life, church life, it's pretty jarring to come across people who have had a different experience, <laughs> who've experienced you know, church horror stories. And sadly, they're out there. They often involve accounts of leaders, pastors, elders having abusive relationships, unethical behavior, immoral behavior. You know, church elders can commit terrible sins. Pastors can go bad and have. You know, ungodly conduct by an elder, by a pastor, is an awful thing, a terrible thing. Because elders have been given an extremely high standard by God himself, haven't they? Back in chapter 3, when we looked at the qualifications for an elder in the first seven verses there of chapter 3, we, we saw how high that standard was. Elders are accountable, obviously, before God, to God. Elders are accountable to the churches that they, they serve, to, to live according to the standards laid out in the Bible. The title of the, the message this morning is, is Accountable Leadership. But the focus of the accountability that we're going to look at this morning is not primarily the responsibility of the elders to God or to the church. <laughs> the primary area of accountability we want to look at today is the, is the accountability the church has, we have, the congregation has towards elders. This morning, as we look at verses 17 through 25 of chapter 5, I want to look with you at three key areas of church accountability. Three critical areas where the church has responsibility in regard to its elders. And these three areas really are critical. For a church to live out the gospel, for a church to be effective in carrying out its mission, to proclaim the good news of Jesus to the ends of the earth, it needs godly leadership. Godly elders. For a church to be healthy, it, it must carry out these responsibilities that Paul lays out in these verses. When a church is unhealthy, when a church is dysfunctional, you can trace the problem or problems 
almost invariably back to one of these three areas that will be talked about. So let's look together at our responsibility as a congregation, as a, a church, as a church family, when it comes to elders. If you're taking notes across the top of the page, you might want to write three responsibilities the church has regarding elders. And the three responsibilities, of course, will be the three main points of the message. Let's jump right in. The first responsibility that the Apostle Paul gave the church through Timothy is that the church is to honor its elders. That's pretty simple, isn't it? The church is to honor its elders. The first area where the church is accountable is to, is to do this, give honor to its elders. Give honor means that the church is to acknowledge, is to recognize, is to esteem and value the work that is done by the elders, and then give respect, give admiration, appreciation and support to those who've been called to serve as elders. To show honor, to give honor to the elders means to value and respect and support the elders and the work that they do. And God calls the church body to do that. We see this in verse 17. Let's look at it together. It says, the elders who rule well, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. The elders being referred to here, it's not just referring to elderly men in the church, it's talking about those in the church, the men who hold the office of elder. And verses 17 through 25 are dealing with how the church is to deal with those holding that office. If you have the ESV, you'll notice that 17 through 25, it's all one paragraph. It's all, uh, the subject is elders. Now, when we looked at the qualifications for elders back in chapter 3, 1 through 7, I pointed out that the terms pastor, elder, overseer are used interchangeably in, in Scripture. And I'm not going to take the time to lay that case out again. But elders have three basic areas of, of responsibility. And these correspond, in a sense, to the, to the different titles that they're given. First of all, elders are given overall responsibility to lead the church. They're to direct the affairs of the church. They're to oversee the affairs of the church. In fact, in chapter 3, verse 1, Paul referred to the elders as overseers. <laughs> They are called to give oversight, leadership. And we see this in verse 17 of, of our text today. It says, he, it says, the elders who rule well are to be given honor. Now, the, the word rule has a rather negative connotation in our society today. But, but this rule, of course, is not authoritarian rule. It's not autocratic rule. This is, this is servant rule. Leadership, servant ruling, an elder is to lead like Jesus led. The second area of responsibility for an elder is that they're to care for the members of the church. The overseer, they're also called pastors, which means shepherd. An elder is to care for the spiritual, emotional, and if necessary, even physical needs of those in the congregation. They're to shepherd or pastor the flock. And then the third area of responsibility is that the elder is to teach, provide instruction, give God's authoritative word to the congregation. And all elders are required to be able to teach. That's given in chapter 3, uh, verse 2. It's an essential part of shepherding. Feed the flock. And what do we, what are the, what's the flock fed? The flock is fed the word of God. Now, Paul says that if an elder is ruling well, directing the affairs of the church, overseeing the church, carrying out his responsibilities rightly, correctly, well, that's what that word means, rule well, then they are to be considered worthy of honor, and not just honor, but double honor. Now, the word honor is, is a key word, and it's important that we understand what it means. It, it means more than just showing respect or, oh, I'm going to honor that person in some sort of attitudinal way. The word honor means, and I quote from Mounce's Greek dictionary, an estimate of worth, value, careful regard, 
honor, state of honor, dignity, and then notice this, honorarium, compensation. The word honor comes up in the Bible a lot. And when you, you give honor to someone, you are indicating value in some tangible way. Uh, as, and sometimes, it's, as is seen in the definition that I just read to you, it includes giving money. Now, what exactly the giving of the honor entails depends on the context. For example, in the Ten Commandments, we're told on the Fifth Commandment to what? Honor your father and your mother. What does honor mean in that, in that verse? Well, it depends on the, on the context. And after saying honor your father and mother, the rest of the Bible kind of unpacks what that means in various in various ways. For children still living at home, to honor your parents means what? You obey them. Paul made this explicit in Ephesians 6, 1 through 3. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise that it might go well with you. For older children, who have left the nest, so to speak, honoring your parents means providing for them in their senior years with whatever help they need. And in the first century, it was often financial help. They didn't, they didn't have Social Security. If, if parents needed help to, to survive, the, the children were to provide that. They were to show honor. And it didn't just mean, oh, I respect my mom and dad. It's, no, you, you ponied up and met their material needs. In Matthew 15, Jesus confronted the Pharisees for a, a particular practice they had. It was called Corban. <laughs> Corban means devoted to God. And the Pharisees said, well, if you have money that you were going to use to support your parents, you know, to, to honor them, if you make some sort of a, a pledge here to, to give it to God, give it to the temple, then you're released from your duty. You're released from your obligation to, to honor your parents. And, and Jesus was not okay with it. <laughs> Listen to, to what he said. He said, why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, honor your father and your mother. And whoever reviles his father or mother must surely die. But you say, if anyone tells his father or mother, what you would have gained from me is, to, is given to God. He need not honor his father. So for the sake of your tradition, you've made void the word of God. Jesus couldn't be clear. Don't take money that you need to give to your parents to honor God and, and think that if you give it to the temple, you're, you're released from that. Now here in 1 Timothy 5, 17, the, in the context of the word honor makes it clear that Paul is talking about giving to the elders something more than just respect or a nice note of appreciation. It's talking about compensation. And we see this because in verse 18, Paul says this, for the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. And the laborer deserves his, his wages, deserves to get paid. Now this quotation, you shall not muzzle the ox while it's treading out the grain, is a quotation from Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 5. In 1 Corinthians, Chapter 9, verse 9, Paul quotes that verse in Deuteronomy uh, to make the case that gospel workers are entitled to receive financial compensation from their work, even though Paul wasn't availing himself of that, of that privilege or that right. Now, in this passage, Paul is saying that the elders who do their work well, who do it correctly, rightly, in a commendable way, are to be compensated. They're to be given an honorarium. They're to be paid. And Paul says that they're to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. Now, what is double honor? <laughs> well, earlier in this chapter, we learned about widows. And Gary preached on it last week. That, that widows, in verse 3, are to be given honor. Those widows who served the church in a ministry and they had requirements and qualifications they had to meet, but they were to be given honor. Is Paul saying that the elders are to be given twice as much as the, as the widows were given? Maybe. We, we don't really know. We don't know exactly what Paul meant. The New Living Translation uh, translates the phrase as they are to be paid well. What is clear is that the honor involves some sort of, of financial compensation. 
Paul doesn't get into the specifics. He just gives a principle, doesn't he? And the principle is, is from Scripture. The two passages of Scripture that Paul quotes, one is from the Old Testament and one is from the New Testament. The, the New Testament quotation, it's taken from guess where? From Jesus. If you have an English Standard Version red letter edition, verse 18 has, has a little splotch of red in it. This is, this is Jesus' statement. And those, those uh, sections, those little verses in red are pretty rare outside Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, aren't they? This is, this is pretty rare. But Jesus said the worker deserves to, to be paid. And the reference to the ox, to an ox laboring, treading out grain. They would use an ox to move this giant stone, you know, that would grind the, the grain. The reference to that is, is, is something that needs to be meditated on and, and thought about. An ox treading out grain is working, is laboring for its owner, in a sense. And how does it get paid? Well, it gets paid with... With, with grain. And as it's pulling the grinding stone, it needs the nourishment that the grain provides in order to do its job. And God cares about animals. In the law of Moses, it says, make sure when that thing's working so hard for you that you don't stick a muzzle on it so it's, it's not able to eat the, the grain. The principle is pretty obvious. Make sure you pay those doing the work enough so their own needs are met in our circumstance, we'd say the needs of their, their family, and that they have enough so that they can concentrate on what? Doing the work that they need to do. Now, regarding the flock, Paul is saying, do this. Regarding elders, Paul is saying, do this, especially for those who labor at preaching and teaching. Now, is Paul saying here that elders who, who preach or teach publicly that they're more valuable, that they're more important than the other elders, and so they should be paid more uh, double honor than the, than the other elders? No. All elders are important. All elders have a vital role. They work as a team. There's a plurality of elders. But this verse is letting us know that the work of preaching, and that word is logos, <laughs> It's, it's talking about the word, the ministry of the, of the word. The preaching and teaching of the word is to be a high priority within the church. Now, all elders must be what? Able to teach. And, and they do teach in counseling, in meetings, in all kinds of, of settings. But, but, but the ministry of the word is not the only responsibility. There's leadership responsibility. There's the care of the flock and as a pastor, as a shepherd. But the, but the ministry of preaching, the ministry of teaching is never to be neglected. That's, that's a key principle that's from this, this verse. Paul's telling the church through Timothy to make sure that they support the elders as they work, as they labor, especially doing the hard work that it takes to present the word of God, to, to preach the, the word of God. These two verses, verse 17 and 18, are an indication that fairly early on in the, in the Christian church that some elders, because of the time and the effort that it took to preach and teach, were paid so that they could focus on that, on preaching and teaching. And to this day, this pattern, it's a common practice, isn't it? Now, all elders, as I've said, have to be able to teach, but some elders will focus and and on preaching and teaching more than others. And as elders serve, it's important that their needs are met, that they're appropriately supported so they can do the work that God has called them to do and, and take care of their families. Now, some elders are able to serve and, and provide for their needs without being paid by the congregation. It happens in, in many churches, just different life situations and stages sometimes. Other elders, as they serve, incur expenses in connection with their, their work, and they need to be reimbursed for expenses so that they're able to provide fully for their families and able to, to carry out the, the work that they've been given. Other elders are paid to work full-time. Why? So that the ministry of the Word, the preaching ministry, the teaching ministry, is carried out. Now, this, 
This passage is dealing specifically with with elders. There's an elder focus here. But there are principles here for other ministries connected with the church. Correct? As a church, we need to be careful that we don't use people. (laughs) We are not to to burn people out. Uh, that we, we need to adequately provide support for people who, who serve in our church body. Now, we're a family, correct? And in a family, everyone is expected to contribute. Everyone is expected to serve. Everyone, in a sense, has chores that we, that we do. It's just part of being a family. And there are, are many areas where, where we can volunteer our time and efforts and, and plug in various places. But there are some areas of ministry where the amount of time, where the amount of training, where the amount of effort that needs to be given to it on a regular, ongoing basis is such that it would adversely affect someone's ability to provide for their own family if they weren't compensated in some way. It would, it would distract them, keep them from being able to do the work if, if they weren't compensated in some way. And Paul's saying the church needs to, to do that. Now, at Lake Taps, we've given our deacons the responsibility to make sure that the people volunteering and serving in our our church family are adequately resourced and and supported. And we've given them the responsibility that that those serving in positions that involve uh, being paid are fairly compensated. As a congregation, we realize this is our responsibility before God, but but we have deacons who serve us and help us in in this area. If you've made a living commitment to Lake Taps in in membership, then you have a role in seeing that we not only honor our elders appropriately, but but honor everyone who's who's serving for the cause of of Christ. As Brian mentioned, coming up in in two weeks on January 31st, we will have our annual members meeting. And at that meeting, not only will we affirm our, our leadership, the elders and deacons, but we will also at that meeting look at the budget that the deacons and, and elders as well have, have put, put forward, and we will uh, vote on it. So approving the budget, that's an important part of, this, of obeying this, this command. But even beyond that, I, think, I hope you will meditate deeply on this. Think about the work that elders do. Think about the, the, the work that the church has been assigned to do. And especially think about the ministry of the word. The mission of our church is the proclamation of a message. The good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and the preaching and proclaiming of that message is at the heart of what we do. It happens here, but it's, it goes out throughout the, the whole church. And think about this. Ask yourself... Am I giving the honor God would have me give, not just to the ministry of, of the elders, but for the, for the work of the church and for the work of the kingdom of God? So that's responsibility number one, to, to honor the elders and support and value and recognize uh, not just elders, but all those who are serving the Lord. But a second key area of responsibility we have as a church, and a second area where we are accountable in regard to elders, is that we, as a church, as a congregation, are responsible to hold our elders accountable to the standards God has given for being an elder. We are accountable to hold our elders accountable to the standard that God has has laid out in his word. We're to make sure that the elders are living up to the qualifications that are in 1 Timothy chapter 3, 1 to 7. We have a responsibility to, to make sure those serving as elders are living the way God's called them to live. And if an elder will not walk in godliness, strays and won't come back, if they refuse to live according to the standard God has given, they're to be rebuked as an example to others. Accountable leadership means that elders, leaders are not off limits when it comes to to correction, when it comes to to rebuke. But the accountability has to be done the right way. And Paul addresses this in verses 19 through 21. This little middle section says this. Do not admit a charge 
against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest may stand in fear. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. The office of elder is a great responsibility. It's been ordained by God. Elders are to be treated with, with honor and with respect and are to be supported. But part of the way that a church shows honor and respect to an elder is by not entertaining an accusation against an elder when it's unsubstantiated. Part of the way of showing respect for someone is, is by not having an appetite for unsubstantiated rumors. If someone takes a cheap shot at an elder, the elder needs to know that the church has, has his, his back. Mere innuendo and rumors are not to be treated as fact. Not every accusation is credible. An elder is not to be subjected to, to a, just a witch hunt. But... <laughs> Big but, if allegations are credible, if there is evidence, if there is testimony on the part of more than one person, then the charge, the accusation, must be taken seriously. And if the elder has done wrong or is doing something wrong, it must be addressed. They must be corrected. They must be faced with the evidence confronted, not in a hostile, belligerent sort of way, but very firmly and in, and in love. Hopefully, if they've done wrong or if they're doing wrong, they will repent, they will turn back. And, and, and hopefully it would be something not of such a magnitude that, magnitude that would disqualify them from service. But if after being confronted, they continue, as the text says in verse 20, to persist in sin, they're to be called to account. How? What's it says right here? Rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest may stand in fear. This is probably referring to a very sobering congregational meeting <laughs> where, where this is what's been alleged. We believe it's credible. We've checked it out. It is true. We're rebuking this elder and, and probably disqualifying, you know, it, just eliminating them from, from that position. And Paul tells Timothy strongly, make sure the church does this. Timothy, make sure the church follows through with this. How does Paul add solemnity and, and authority to his statement? What I've told you to do, I've given you this in the presence of who? God and of Christ Jesus and of the holy angels. And he says, you're to do this without prejudging. Do nothing from partiality. Prejudging means discrimination, prejudice. Could be translated partiality. You know, keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. The word partiality in many translations is translated favoritism. If an elder persists in sin, if he continues in sin, he, they must be called out. They must be rebuked, publicly rebuked. It doesn't matter who they are. Sadly, some elders, some pastors, some leaders, when compelling evidence of their guilt, of their sin, comes to light, have not been called to account. <laughs> they've, they've been given a pass. Why? Why have they been given preferential treatment? Why have they been shown favoritism? Why have people looked the other way? Well, there's a, there's a lot of reasons. Sometimes it's because people just love them. They're nice. They've been kind. They've, they've done things for you. And man, I just feel so bad after the kind of relationship I've had to, to call this person to account. Sometimes it's, it's because they've been around for a long time. They've had a, a long tenure as, as a leader. And it's easy for someone to say, you know, I've just been here a short time. You know, this elder's been here forever. And, and who am I to, to, to say anything? Sometimes it's because an elder or pastor, leader, 
just has great gifts. They got a lot of charisma, or they're just exceptionally powerful leaders, or they're just a brilliant teacher. Whatever it is, the church goes, oh, you know, how if we removed them, I mean, I mean, what would we do? How would we we function? Sometimes it's because the person has lots of close relationships with a lot of people, maybe family connections with, within a church, and you think, man, if I bring this to light. I am going to have a lot of people upset at me. <laughs> Not just disinterested, dispassionate people, but, but people with a strong connection, perhaps, with this leader. Whatever the reason, it might be hard, and it could be exceptionally hard. Paul says, make sure the church holds its elders accountable. Do not put elders, a pastor, on a pedestal. Don't just look at them. Recognize that the church is what? The household of the living God. Paul told Timothy, the instructions I've given you to hold elders accountable, I've given them to you in the presence of God, of Christ Jesus, and in the presence of the elect angels. Who are the elect angels? Well, those are the angels that didn't follow the devil when he, when he revolted against God. And, and you remember, you know, these are kind of obscure references in the, in the Bible. But when we studied 1 Corinthians in, in chapter 11, Paul indicated that, that, that angels attend church. <laughs> they're, they're there. That's why the, the women were to wear head coverings in the first century. And, and we can't see them, but if we could, we would tremble in awe. I mean, we would be, we would be you know, just overwhelmed by, by their majesty and presence. But it's not just the, the elect angels. It's, it's God himself. It's Christ Jesus. We're to carry out these instructions in the fear of the Lord. Are you still tracking with me? We're two-thirds of the way through. First responsibility is what? Honor your elders. Honor the, the work and, and, and respect, appreciate, support the elders. Number two, hold the elders accountable to the standards that God has, has given. The third and final responsibility that we'll look at this morning that we have as a church regarding elders is that we have a responsibility to make sure that the right people, in the case of elders, the right men, are set apart as elders. We are accountable to make sure that the right people are appointed to serve. I like to call this guarding the gate. We are accountable as a church to guard the gate and make sure that the wrong people don't get into that position of elder. It means we have a responsibility to do due diligence. We have a responsibility to vet those who are being considered for the office of elder. And this is what Paul is addressing in verses 22 through 25. He says this, Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands. That's how the church would ordain or, or set apart a, a leader. Nor take part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. The sins of some people are conspicuous going on before them to judgment, but the sins of others appear later. So also good works are conspicuous, and even those that are not cannot remain hidden. Now Paul is writing this letter to Timothy. He's addressing him directly, and it becomes pretty obvious because he addresses his, his problem with his sickness, which is kind of an interesting little sidelight. But, but the instruction is for the whole church. Through Timothy, Paul is telling the church, be careful about who you appoint, who you set apart as an elder. Don't be in a hurry. Take your time to carefully evaluate a person. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the qualifications for an elder are given in 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7. They're also given in the book of Titus uh, in verses 1, 5 through 9 of chapter 1. 
The lists are fairly extensive. It requires evaluation. It requires uh, the church to consider a man's personal life, his family life, his, his relationship with outsiders out, out in the world. There's a lot to consider. If a man did not meet the qualifications, it might not be readily apparent if he just were making a, a quick snap judgment. If the church rushed ahead and appointed a man as an elder and a bad apple got in, who's going to be affected by that man's sin? The whole church. Everyone is, is, is touched by that sin. In some way, the church would share in the sins of others. And that's what Paul's talking about in verse 22. Do not be too quick to appoint someone as an elder and don't share in the sins of others. Clearly, an, an elder who sins is accountable to God and accountable to the, the congregation for their sin. But if the church has not done due diligence, if the church has been careless in the laying on of hands, if the elder was not properly vetted, then the church is complicit. It shares in his sin, which is a sobering thought. We're not to be involved with sin. We are to be what? Holy. We're to be above reproach. And in the last line of verse 22, Paul tells Timothy, keep yourself pure. And he's not just talking to Timothy, is he? The whole church. You keep yourself pure. Don't be hasty in laying on of hands, nor take part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. I want to suggest to you that, that a critical element in guarding the gate is for all of us. Every leader, every elder, every deacon, every brother and sister in the church family live so pure, so holy before God, so above reproach that no one who's not serious about godliness, that no bad apple would want to have anything to do with being an elder. <laughs> Keep ourselves pure. For us to guard the gate, we have to guard our own lives and have purity. Now, Paul challenged Timothy to have true purity. Not superficial purity, not a phony purity. And Paul did this by making a little parenthetical comment about Timothy's stomach. <laughs> And his use of, of a little bit of, of wine. If you have an ESV, you'll notice verse 23 is in parentheses. I mean, this is, this is a parenthetical statement, but it's a part of this, of this section. He says, no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your fre frequent ailments. Evidently, Timothy did not have a strong constitution. He was, he was sickly. He, he had stomach issues. And it, interestingly, Paul doesn't say, Timothy, just... Pray the prayer of faith and you'll be healed and we'll do this. You know, there's a place for that. But here, Paul instead gives him what? A little medical advice. Timothy, I, whatever's going on with your stomach, you would be helped by drinking a little bit of wine. Timothy wasn't doing that. <laughs> Why not? Well, we don't know exactly. Text doesn't tell us. I'm reading between the lines here a, a little bit. But, but it seems to me that a likely scenario is that Timothy, in his role as a pastor, as an elder, wanted to be seen as pure. He, his desire for purity was having an unintended consequence. It was allowing impurities to grow in his stomach. In the ancient world, as well as today, don't think it was way different back then as it is today, alcohol was widely abused. Drunkenness was a, was a serious problem. Drug addiction and, and substance abuse is, was you know, epidemic then as it is today. And Timothy undoubtedly saw it happening in Ephesus and said to himself, I don't want to be associated with that in any way, shape, or form. And, and so he, he didn't. But, but for Timothy, abstaining from alcohol wasn't true purity. It was just... It was just a superficial thing. If someone saw Timothy having a glass of wine and jumped to the conclusion that he had a problem with alcohol, they would be making a snap judgment. They would be completely wrong. And I think the reason Paul puts this out there is in a very subtle, shrewd way, he's letting the, the church know, yes, 
Prospective elders need to have godliness and, and real purity, but, but don't just make a snap judgment about someone's life. Don't just jump to conclusions. Don't look superficially. Look deeply. It takes time. It takes wisdom. It takes work to carefully evaluate someone's life. We need great discernment. Why? Well, the answer is in verse 24 and 25. Look at it. The sins of some people are conspicuous, going before them to judgment. You don't need time to figure it out. I mean, they're a walking disaster. It's, it's clear what's going on. But the sins of others appear later. We've all seen this, right? There's somebody, they seem to be tracking for the Lord. They seem to be godly. They seem to be going okay. And then you find out that, man, they, the whole time, they, something was, was going on. Verse 25, so also good works are conspicuous. Some you see right away. It's like, wow, that person's awesome. Look at what they're, they're doing. And or but even those that are not cannot remain hidden. Sins in a person's life, flaws in someone's character are not readily apparent. So you need to have careful discernment. But the good works that a person does, that might just, by the way, make them an excellent elder, <laughs> may not be readily apparent right away as, as well. I like what the, the Tyndale commentary says about this. I read it earlier in the week, and I couldn't remember where I found it, and I spent time just searching for it, because it's just such a powerful little paragraph. Listen to this. Because he's talking about the sins of, of some men go before and the good deeds. He says, this, these parallel observations viewing human potentialities both negatively and positively, bring out forcefully the complexities involved in selecting suitable candidates for God's work. That's profound. Hasty action relies on first impressions, but these impressions are often deceptive. Unworthy men might be chosen whose moral culpability lies deeper than the surface, and worthy men whose good actions are not in the limelight might easily be overlooked. The whole situation demands extreme caution. <laughs> and so it does. But the wrong elder, a bad apple, in that shepherd role, in that pastor role, absolutely will bring ruin to a church. And more importantly, dishonor God. It's imperative that we guard the gate. If you know me very well, you know I love little proverbs, little aphorisms. I'm always, always saying a little, a little proverb. How about this one? An ounce of prevention is worth what? Pound of cure. A stitch in time saves nine. You know, God gives us the res responsibility to exercise foresight, prudence, caution before appointing elders, before laying on of hands. We have a number of people in our church family who are in business and in management and are responsible for hiring people. And I always love to, to talk with them and find out about their, their work. But I, I will never forget one guy said to me, and I, and I don't think it was original with him, it's, it's probably just a standard business axiom, but he looked at me and he said, Tim, hire tough, manage easy. <laughs> hire easy, manage tough. <laughs> it can be tough to guard the gate. It does require work, but what really takes a lot of work is dealing with an elder who should have never been an elder in the first place. That will give a church gray hairs. That will give the other elders major problems. And sadly, it happens far too often. The wrong person gets in there. What? How does it happen? Well, sometimes we see a need for an elder. And instead of praying about it and waiting on, on God and doing our due diligence, we get impatient. And we say, well, we've got to have somebody. I mean, the need is so great. We've we got to have somebody. Let's just, you know... Never mind, yeah, just, they're good, go. And that's, that's a prescription for disaster. Sometimes, I want to suggest to you, it's a combination of laziness and bad theology. 
all, all wrapped up into one. We look at someone, make a superficial judgment, we think they, they look good, and then we convince ourselves that God in His sovereignty and power will just make it be all wonderful and perfect. <laughs> we, we like to wear rose-colored glasses. And don't get me wrong, we need to pray and, and rely on God, but God has given us the responsibility to carefully evaluate not just prospective elders, but deacons and, and others who serve in the church as well, and we need to do it. There are many churches, many organizations who have hired or appointed people to positions of leadership who in hindsight have said, you know what, I should have called those references. I, I should have made that call. I should have followed up on that person's concern. At Lake Taps, a big part of our guarding the gate, a big part of our making sure that the elders are the, are the right men to serve and that, that the right people are appointed as deacons, men and women, to serve in various ministries is what we call our affirmation process. And Brian made reference to it in, in the announcements. Every year we reappoint all of our leaders, all the elders and all the deacons. There's not three-year terms. Every year we affirm our leaders at our annual meeting. In November... We inform our church family of the various people who are being put forward to serve. And then we ask our church family, we ask you to carefully pray and carefully evaluate whether or not they meet the qualifications for their position. If you don't know them, we encourage you and ask you, get to know them. Do, do, some, do some work and, and preferably talk to them and invite them over. But if you do know them, and you know of some reason why they should not serve, and especially if there's, if there's some sin in their, their life, we ask you to take action. Not as a church member, but, but as a Christian. In the spirit of Matthew 18, you're supposed to, you're supposed to go to them and, and warn them and, and help them. If there are other reasons why a person just is not a good fit, they're not qualified, and you're aware of it, we ask you to, to speak with one of the elders or speak with one of the deacons about it. It's so important that we guard the gate. It's been heavy stuff this morning, hasn't it? But these are three areas where we are accountable. This is, this is our responsibility as a church, that we honor our elders, recognize and, and appreciate and support the work they're tasked with doing, and honor and support those who serve in other areas of ministry as well. That we hold our elders especially accountable. It's important that we hold deacons accountable. It's important that we hold one another accountable. But it's especially important that we hold elders accountable. And we must do our part to make sure that the right people are appointed to serve, that we guard the gate. Last week in our worship service, we, we sang a song called, I Believe. Remember that? It's called The Creed. And towards the end of the, the song, it says this, I believe in life eternal. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion and in your what? Holy church. Every time I sing that song, it just sends a shiver up and down my spine. Because I believe in life eternal. I do believe in the virgin birth. I do believe in the saints' communion. And I believe in God's holy church. We are his redeemed people, bought by the blood of the Lamb, and we've been made holy in, in Christ. The blueprints that we've been given in God's word are his holy blueprints. And our holiness, of course, is in Christ. While we live in these bodies, we have a sinful nature. We have something called the, the flesh. We are being sanctified. We're being made holy. It's a process. But because of Jesus, because of his work for us on the cross, he has declared us righteous. He has declared us holy. And he expects us in the power of the Holy Spirit to live righteous and holy lives. Not just in heaven someday, but, but right now. And I want you to know, if you're a believer in Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit, you can live a life worthy of the calling you've received. We can be a healthy church. 
We won't be a perfect church <laughs> until we see Jesus face to face, but we can live lives that bring honor and glory to him. We can have a church family that, that demonstrates the gospel, doesn't just talk about it, lives it out and shows what it's actually like. We can be fruitful, effectively carrying out the mission Jesus has given to us. And we've summed up that mission at Lake Taps in this, in this little statement. The Lake Taps Community Church is committed to honoring God by introducing people to Jesus Christ, helping them grow in the faith, and equipping them to reach others. That is our mission as His holy church. I'm so thankful to be a part of God's holy church. I'm, a part, I'm so thankful to be a part of the family of God and to be a part of this expression of His family, the Lake Taps Community Church. I hope that you are as well. I don't deserve to be. Neither do you. It's because of God's grace. It's because of His mercy. It's because of His great compassion. It's because of His love for us that He sent His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us. And on the cross, He sealed my pardon paid the debt, and set me free. And because of the cross, through faith in Jesus, we receive forgiveness of sins. We've been given the gift of the Holy Spirit. Because of the cross, we're brought into God's forever family. It's because of the cross we get to eat and drink of what ultimately satisfies with our brothers and sisters at the Lord's table. And because of the cross, we will spend eternity in a perfect place, the kingdom of God. Aren't you glad? It's all come to us through the cross, through the death of Jesus. And each week, we remember the Lord's death. And it's our commitment to do that until He comes. If your faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ, and if you are following Him in obedient Faith, we invite you to participate with us in the, the Lord's table as we conclude this service. But before we do that, let's take a few moments and just uh, pray and reflect on, on what he's done for us.